Hey everybody, it's Kristen. I wanted to make a short little video here on how to do a literature review and put all your information into an evidence table. So I'm sharing my screen here and I want to show you a little template that I have made that's really been um, a big help to me um, in making um, recommendations and writing policies. When you're trying to find out <clears throat> what is best clinical practice, you want to do a full review of the current literature that's available, and then you want to put it into this evidence table here. So um, this is a template, and I've taken out the title that, the, um, that this was, which was a, a external precautions literature review. And um, I would just say, retitle this, you know, save as, and retitle this as the title of your literature review. And then you're always going to want to consider your literature review in context to, is this a quality improvement issue? Is this a process improvement? Uh, essentially, I always start with, what is the problem to solve? And it's a good thing when we can say that, um, you know, what is the clinical practice issue that we need to work on? Where, is it an outcome problem? Do we have an event? Are we just noticing something um, in our process as far as a gap? And then we're going to use the PICO. Uh, which is an acronym for Population Intervention Comparison and Outcome, to frame a question that's going to help guide uh, the literature review. And so how it goes, this is an example but of a PICO question. In an inpatient hospital care area, what is the impact of evidence-guided policies? So obviously we know that we should have evidence-guided policies, but when I say I'm going to choose this population, so in an inpatient uh, critical care population, the intervention would be um, what is the impact of intervention um, using CHG baths compared to standard of care or non-CHG baths? Um, what is the impact of that intervention on infection rates, surgical site infections or central line infections or, you know, whatever that outcome is. And so you want it to be small enough, more uh, narrow enough so that you can actually find some good information. If you have a really broad PICO question, you are going to find thousands of articles and um, you'll have a really big evidence table and it'll be really hard to come to a conclusion. So you really want to use this format of a PICO question to help narrow down um, the, the question that you're really researching. Um, and then I, this is just an ex explanation here of a statement to say, I've left some information in here to kind of guide the format um, that has been helpful to me. I like to keep this in a bold format over here for the name of the article. And I always um, right click and I link articles here or you can just copy paste the URL or the DOI which is the electronic article link so that when you need to go back and look it up or print it, it's right there for people. And then helpful content when you're reading the article, this is stuff that you pull out. This is, you know, why that article speaks to um, your question that you've written, the PICO question. And then over here, you're going to level the evidence. And I have um, some references for how to level evidence uh, down below, but just wanted to give this structure. So you would be taking these things out and replacing them with the literature that you are finding. And then here's a few more things I left in. So you can see up here, this is a level one randomized control trial. And I wanted to give you an example of what that was. And then these are levels three and four evidence. Um, you can use really specific leveling tables. These are some good examples. I like to use um, the, the basic one through five. Here's another explanation of it. If you want to be more specific, you can use the number letter system. This correlates to these tables. It just gives you more categories of a level 1A, is a systematic review with homogeneity of randomized control trials, a level 1B is an individual randomized control file, uh, trial with a narrow confidence interval, um, and a level 1C is all or none study. Um, these, like I said, they correlate to the level one through five tables, but they have more little um, subsections of letters in the levels one through three because that um, can be kind of congested when you're looking at a lot of medical studies. So um, choose the one that is um, best fitting the evidence that you're finding in your literature review and you can level it. So either one is fine, but the explanation of the levels is here. So the higher the level um, of quality is going to be the level one, so closest to one. And then the lower quality is going to be down here at the bigger numbers, level five or foundational evidence. 
Okay, I want to show you really quickly inside of our clinical library. I've opened up a few tabs here. So um, if you're doing this search from inside um, the KP firewall, um, this is what you'll see when you go to our clinical library. I'd like to use some of these sources like CINAHL, Clinical Key, PubMed, OneSearch, and UpToDate. These are some of my favorite um, search engines. EBSCOhost is the CINAHL um, host and they're very good. Other things that you can choose, you know, Google Scholar has some nice things to offer and it's accessible to the general public, so that's helpful. Um, CINAHL is a pretty big engine, so we're just going to choose that. So I chose CINAHL. Actually, this is the electronic books. Here's CINAHL. So when I was searching some things, see it's hosted by EBSCOhost, I typed in central lines and I put the word here insertion. So I'm looking for central lines somewhere in the title um, of the subject field and then I'm looking for also the inclusion of insertion. So here's my two searches, search one, central line and insertion and then search to central line insertion and I clicked on I want full text so I want to be able to see everything and so then my results are here and there's 29 of them. It's ordering them by the newest first which is very helpful so in general we want to choose evidence that is within the last five years. Published within the last five years is an industry standard for um, current evidence. If people are not researching or publishing on a certain topic um, you're not going to see it um, in a lot of the current research and there's usually reason for that so that kind of helps guide us. So I clicked on this guy right here and I specifically clicked on the PDF full text and that opened this. Well actually no, it, I clicked on the link. Here's the full text. I'm going to open this. It's going to open it here. And I'll read this and I can print it out if that's my way to review things. I have gotten adjusted to just reading on screens and copying and pasting things. And I wanna show you something. So if this were an article that I wanted to include in my literature review, um, I would read it and I would find out what kind, of, um, what kind of journal it is, what kind of article it is, what are we doing? So, and to find that out, you're gonna need to read the whole thing, but you're also gonna read the methods section because that's gonna tell you what kind of study design they set up. Now here in the method synopsis, I see that it's a retrospective pre and post intervention design that was comparing CLABSI rates of 30 patients who did not receive, um, 30 patients receiving CHG. Okay, so this is a CHG um, study and um, they're looking at things pre and post intervention and they're comparing CLABSI rates. Okay, cool. So it gives me their results and it's important because I wanna see what their, their total N is 30. So, um, that's valuable to know that it was not that big of a study, you know, 30 people, um, but it's good. And it's got a really low P interval here, which means it's statistically significant. It's confidence interval is very small, so it's duplicable. Um, so that's gonna help me figure out how to put this in my table. And I haven't read this, so sorry, I'm just breezing through it. But I would essentially take this information, I would copy it and paste it, and I would put it over here in, um, in my table, which ran away on me. Sorry, hold on. <laughs> here it is. Here's our table. I would copy and paste it here. And I would, when I go to paste, I would choose keep the format. So let me show you how to do that. We're over here at the article. Now, first off, this is the link right here. And it's through EBSCOhost. So if I link this out, and I'm not within the KP firewall, I won't be able to get to it, but I'm gonna choose copy, and then here, right click, and um, I'm gonna change this hyperlink. I'm gonna edit the hyperlink. This was an example. And so right there is where I paste the new hyperlink. So now that's linked to my EBSCO host. See that there? And we need the name of the article. And I can probably get a, a pretty good list of this. Copy. This is the name. When I go to paste, I'm going to choose this guy right here to merge the formatting. If you choose this, it takes the formatting from, from the original, but that's a lot. So I don't want that. I want this. All right. And this was a 2020 article. 
let's see, research for practice. Here's our authors. It's pretty big. I need to make this smaller. All right, Med Surgeon Nursing, May, June 2020, volume 29, number 23. So that's what I would put here. May, June 2020. Med Surge Nursing. And I want to get it right. Um, if I just go back, which is where this is, sometimes if I go over here, so I just click the back button. If I go to site, a lot of search engines will do this really nice thing for you. They will give you the exact citation in whatever format you want. I'm an APA girl, so I like to choose them. And you would just have it right there. <laughs> and I love that because, you know, you're going to need to include, oh, I just pasted it incorrectly. If I choose this, merge formatting, it's going to get rid of that original formatting. But see, that's all EP format right there. So we, it's really important to have a nice chunk that says this is the exact AP format because when we use um, an article to help inform our practice and we write a policy or procedure to that effect, we need to include um, this information in our references section. And so if you've got it queued up right there in AP format, you can come back later and grab it and copy paste it right into your reference section. So I hope this was helpful on um, just a little tip of how to use um, this literature review uh, table, evidence table, and then how to level it, very important. So after you put all the stuff in, you can come back later to these and go, okay, where does that fit in? Um, you know, this med surge uh, nursing article, it was a retrospective uh, pre and post intervention. And so that lets me know it's not a randomized control trial. It's not a perspective uh, comparison study. It kind of fits into this retrospective cohort study. Um, and I can be more specific. So I would probably give it a level three right off the top without actually having read it. I, that's a key piece here. And I might go down here if I want to be really granular and say, okay, is it a 3A or a 3B? If I look at these tables here, 3A is systematic review with homogeneity of uh, case control studies. Um, and then this was, this was one study. Um, and then I have 3B, individual case control study. Hmm. I'm not quite sure which one this article would actually fit into, 3A or 3B, without having read the full article. But that's something you can do if you really want to level it uh, down to a specific level. But it's going to come in at a level three. So then later, if I'm looking over the whole table and I say, well, gosh, there was this really profound um, recommendation made from uh, this article here about chlorhexidine um, bathing and infection rates and central lines. If I want to use that to change a policy or a clinical practice recommendation, I would be able to say, you know, this is a level three study. And um, when I go to zoom out and examine what is the highest level of evidence that we have on a certain issue, I always want to give weight of decision to pieces of evidence that have the highest um, level. So if I have something that's a level four or five, you know, a level five is interesting. It's an expert opinion. And there's a lot of standards for practice um, for ethical reasons that you just cannot do a randomized control trial on. And so a lot of um, a lot of standards of practice come in at a level five because they're expert opinion. And so when we think about, you know, this standard of practice says this, and so I should do that always. But then you put that in context to an evidence table and you go, oh, wait a minute. Actually, there's, there's some better evidence that's available that can help guide the policy I write or the procedure or competency or whatever the case may be. And having that big picture perspective, it's, um, it's a really great thing to zoom out after you've collected you know, 10 or so articles. Start with that. Start with 10 articles and see where the evidence takes you. And it might surprise you. There's been a lot of evidence tables that I tear into thinking, I feel like I know what the outcome's gonna be. And, and sure enough, the evidence takes me in a, in a totally unexpected direction. So it's a pleasant surprise um, to really just 
zoom out, put it all in here and then zoom out and say, oh my gosh, wow. I, all the things that I've known in my practice are really these, you know, lower levels of evidence. And really what I'm seeing is, you know, this higher level of evidence is what, what we should be doing. And so, you know, figuring out a way to do that. Anyway, all right. Well, I think um, you've got the, the hint there. Um, please let me know, as always, if I can help with any questions or, um, you know, whatever, whatever things are going on. If you're making evidence table or working on a policy or procedure or competency, let me know how I can help. Thanks, guys. Bye.